Anticoagulant medication review. We are going to be talking about medications that are high risk, that cause your blood to become very thin, and literally stop the clot. Anticoagulants are considered high alert medications because they can lead to significant adverse drug events, both in the inpatient and outpatient healthcare settings, especially if they're not managed properly. High alert medications refer to drugs that have an increased risk of causing significant harm when they're used in error. And even when they're used as they are supposed to be, there is a high risk of adverse events. With these high alert medications, like the anticoagulants, many of the adverse effects are resulted from medication errors which suggests that they are preventable. Therefore, we're doing some extra training on the anticoagulant medications. Those who give these drugs must take the extra care to know what is being given and the proper administration elements. Joint Commission emphasizes that we need to decrease the possibility of patient harm by accurate and accessible patient education as well as staff education so that we can monitor these adverse events. Exactly what is an anticoagulant medication? If we break down the word anti means against and coagulant as in coagulates, something that thickens and clots like the blood wants to do after an injury like the scabbed area that it creates. It coagulates and makes a scab. Therefore, anticoagulant medication will go against the clotting that blood naturally wants to do. It will take longer to stop any bleeding when these medications are taken. Therefore, the primary goal of any anticoagulant medication is to help prevent blood clots. And if there is a blood clot, it will help treat the existing clots by preventing them from growing larger. These clots can form in patients who are being treated for high risk medical conditions, such as stroke, atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Maybe they've had a heart valve replacement or they've got a clot in their veins that is in their legs or their arms and the clot can possibly run to their lungs, creating a pulmonary embolism. And sometimes clots just form after surgery because they are not moving around as much as they could before. So like I said, blood naturally wants to clot so it can stop the bleeding when there's an injury. So when the blood flow slows down for any reason, such as surgery, such as a medical condition, there is an increased chance that clot will form within the blood vessel. That, this clot can now block off the vessel, or it can actually move inside the body to land in a smaller vessel where it will stop the blood flow to whatever organ or extremity is further beyond. If that happens, the organ or extremity will no longer get the blood it needs to survive because the clot is blocking it off. So there are a few types of anticoagulants, and it's very important to be aware of the similarities and differences with each type. These medications are sometimes referred to as blood thinners. They don't actually cause the blood to become less thick or very thin. They just cause the blood less likely to clot. So therefore, the following anticoagulant medications are the most common ones that you may find being administered at home or in your facility and we will go over the key points for each one. Probably the most common and the longest used one is something called Coumadin or Warfarin. You will see this used specifically for those that have certain medical conditions, like maybe they had a mechanical heart valve replacement. Warfarin is the only medication that is approved for that. Doses of this medication will vary completely from a very small amount to a high amount. And it's according to whatever the blood work they have done, obtained at regular intervals, 
called a PT, a prothrombin time, INR. And according to those numbers, that determines how thick or thin their blood is. Now, the thing to remember with Coumadin is it is extremely affected by their dietary intake especially the use of vitamin K foods, anything with green leafy vegetables, spinach, romaine, green leaf lettuce, and even vegetables like cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. These all have a high amount of vitamin K. Vitamin K will want make the blood clot. Coumadin works against that. So if you're having these vegetables, it's important that you maintain the same amount every day. If you want to have a salad, go ahead and have a salad, but make sure you have one every day, and therefore it stays on the same level. Monitoring your vitamin K intake is very important when you're taking Coumadin. Another medication that is sometimes seen in outpatient is an injectable medication. Now it's called Lovenox or Anoxaparin. And it's only given as an injection, and generally it's very used for short-term bridging, meaning you're going to switch over to a Coumadin, but we got to keep you anticoagulated until the Coumadin level comes up high enough. Or perhaps you had a surgery that is high risk for clots, and for a few days after, you must get these injections. The doses will vary according to whatever medical condition it's treating, and it's an injection, like I said, under the skin, usually once or twice a day in the belly, at least two inches from the belly button. Now there are a number of new medications called DOAX or direct oral anticoagulants. Now in place of Coumadin, these are becoming much more popular and many more people are on these. These are the important ones you need to know if your patient or resident is on. These factor 10A inhibitors, such as Eliquis, Apixaban, Xeralto, Rivaroxaban, and Cerveza, and Doxaban, are all known as direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs. The great thing about them is frequent blood monitoring is not required and dietary intake does not affect them at all. So therefore, unlike Coumadin, you can eat whatever you want and any amount of the vitamin K foods. Now it's important to know a little bit more detail about each of these because they are so common. Eliquis, the apixaban, is given twice a day, every 12 hours, it can be with or without food, but it is very important that this tablet is not crushed or chewed. It must remain whole. On the other hand, Xeralto and Cerveza, Rivaroxaban and Endoxapan, they are only given once a day. And they can be crushed if needed, but you must give them immediately after crushing. In addition, it's important to know that if your patient or your loved one is on Xeralto, it really should be given with food at the evening meal because that helps it to be absorbed better. The other medications, the Cerveza and the Eliquis, can be given without regard to food intake. One other DOAC that is around and sometimes seen is called dibigatrin, also known as Pradaxa. This is not a factor 10A, this is a direct thrombin inhibitor, so it works a little bit differently than the others, but they all do the same thing and they make the blood not clot as easily. Pradaxa is also in a pill form and it's given twice a day. You do not crush or chew this one just like the Eliquis, and it can be given with or without food. Again, like with all the DOACs, frequent blood monitoring is not required. So when quickly reviewing the key points for these DOAC medications, which is the Pradoxa, the Eliquis, the Xeralto, and the Cerveza, 
The Pradaksa and the Eloquis are both twice a day and they cannot be t- crushed. However, the once a day medications, the Xeralto and the Cervesa, both can be crushed and only Xeralto really has a preference that it should be given with food in the evening or whatever the biggest meal of the day is in order to help the drug be absorbed for maximum effectiveness. Now, the most important thing to know with anyone on any of these medications is the most common complication is bleeding. There can be serious life-threatening bleeding that can occur, such as bleeding into the brain, bleeding into the internal organs. But more commonly, minor bleeding is what happens. They may bruise more than usual. Perhaps they have a nosebleed that requires them to hold pressure on it. And even a small cut, like a shaving cut or a razor cut, may cause it to bleed a little bit longer than usual. You should always be on the lookout for any signs of serious bleeding for any patient on these anticoagulants. Perhaps they're persistently nauseous, coughing up blood, Maybe they're vomiting blood or even if it looks like coffee grounds, that indicates it's old blood. Perhaps there's nosebleeds or some kind of cut or bleeding that's lasting longer than 10 minutes after you have applied direct pressure and it's just not stopping. Perhaps the urine has turned red, bloody red or dark brown, meaning old blood. This is a change and this is something you need to look for for anybody taking these medications. Perhaps there is weakness in one part of the body or a severe headache or even their bowel movements have become red, black, or tarry. Tarry indicates old blood has passed through the intestines. So these signs all must be reported immediately. In order to reduce some of the risks for bleeding, if it's a minor cut, you just may need to hold pressure a little bit longer than usual. Direct pressure is the best way to stop the bleeding. You may need to adjust your tasks that you normally do using extra care and caution, such as perhaps shaving with an electric razor rather than a razor blade. Maybe a softer toothbrush when you're brushing your teeth to avoid the gums from bleeding especially caution with any fast movements or climbing to high areas to avoid slips and falls. It is so important to know that when you are taking these anticoagulants or your patient is on them, a serious fall or head injury, even if there are no other symptoms, should always be reported because symptoms may not appear for days or weeks. If they hit their head today and they feel fine, just make sure someone knows that there was a fall with a head injury. And perhaps it may not show for another day, week, month even, and that way they know that they are on anticoagulants and had a fall in the prior days or weeks. So it is extremely important that you prevent adverse events by knowing what medications are high risk. And that allows you to know what patients are at the higher risk of an adverse event. Make it a priority to know who is on anticoagulants in your facility. And those who are already at high risk for falls, such as the elderly and the memory care patients, they have an even more significant risk for adverse events while on the anticoagulation medication. And always err on the side of caution. If there's any indication of uh, any activity or mental changes, especially if there was a fall or any kind of trauma, even if it was days or weeks prior, and notify the healthcare re- provider. You may need to remind them that, hey, these people are on anticoagulant medications and something is just not right and they will look into it further. You can be the patient's best advocate by doing this. Thank you all for your time and your attention.